Good morning. Well, um, thank you for being here this morning uh, to, to join the side event on the missing testimonies of Syrian women deprived of liberty. I welcome you on behalf of the organizers, the European Union delegation and the U.S. mission. Um, we, are here, we are gathered here to hear the testimonies of uh, Syrian women uh, uh, who have direct who have brought uh, to us direct testimonies on uh, the atrocities that have been witnessed since uh, 2011 uh, uh, as a result of the Syrian crisis. And we have these four incredible women uh, to, to tell us the, their stories. Um, before that, uh, I also have the honor of uh, uh, an opening remarks being delivered by Ambassador Halt Stevens, from the head of the European um, Union delegation in, here in Geneva, and also um, Ambassador Rogers Cartons, uh, the, the United States Deputy As Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Um, without further ado, I will first uh, give the floor to Ambassador Stevens and later to Ambassador Carston. Well, Ms. Karam, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, a warm welcome to you all to our side event, uh, but especially a warm welcome to the courageous Syrian women that are here to share their testimonies of what happens and what happens to them in Syria. Um, and I must say, the figures, the numbers are simply striking. There are about 215,000 detainees in Syria, in Syrian prisons. I mean, on more of half of them, we have no, absolutely no news. We don't know what happened with them, if they are still in prison, if they have been killed. So <coughs> it's also very difficult to know what are the exact figures. So we have also the uncertainty about these persons, but also for the families. I mean, these families stay in limbo about what has happened to the relatives. They have no news. Um, I know that ICRC is working hard, but they have opened, they call it opening a file. Uh, they are following only about 10,000 people. Um, also, I mean, arbitration, uh, an arbitrary detention, disappearance, harassment of people in areas that are now being taken, retaken again by the Syrian government from the uh, anti-government groups, they're all too common again, uh, even if the government has signed a reconciliation agreement. People targeted are former opposition leaders, media activists, aid workers, defectors, but also relatives of activists, of former anti-government fighters, family members of persons who have uh, left or fled Syria. We are very much in support and very much uh, appreciate the work of the Special Envoy Geir Petersen, uh, and we're ready to help him also when it comes to his work on uh, detainees, abductees, uh, and missing persons, which is one of his uh, priorities. And we very much also, uh, it's very much also an issue of high priority for the European action. Um, and I know that he has designed also, or Destin uh, is, is, is deputy, to follow this matter very closely. I know also that the Office of the Special Envoy is also uh, present as an observer in the meetings of the Astana Working Group on detainees alongside with the ICSC. But so far there has only been an exchange of about 80 people on three occasions. I mean, if you look at this number and you compare it to the, the figures that I've mentioned in the beginning, it's just a small drop in the ocean. So much more needs to be done, uh, taking also into account the staggering scale of the whole issue. I, I think it's really appalling. Um, amongst those that are detained, the missing persons, many are women, political and civil activists, uh, social, social activists, who are sometimes or often used as a tool of war. Some women were also taken as hostage owing to the relation with uh, members of the opposition. And so though, today we will indeed hear more about these uh, this testimonies, testimonies. Most women detained suffered psychological, physical, sexual, social violence, as well as also uh, disempowerment by their families and deprivation of their children. I would like to recall that last week we, were, we, were, we had the International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, and that Mrs. Mogherini together with Pramila Patton, who is the special representative of the Secretary General uh, on elimination of sexual violence in conflict, 
have joined their forces to call on the international community to accelerate efforts to eliminate the scorch of all forms of sexual violence, including as a strategy and a tactic of war and terror. Sexual violence, indeed, in conflict constitutes a grave human rights violation with devastating physical, uh, psychological and social consequences. The EU and the UN are working very closely together and we are very much committed to further strengthen their work, you know, our work in, in terms of prevention, protection, prosecution, as well as in terms of holistic support to the help the, uh, the survivors rebuild their lives and also their livelihoods within their families and communities. I think it's also key to continue working together to end impunity for perpetrators of all these kind of acts and to guarantee also access to justice, to protection and rep rep uh, reparation for the survivors. Their voices, their rights, their needs must guide us in our response to foster more equitable and peaceful societies. Indeed, we absolutely need accountability and it must be indeed more systematic and we need to do more about it and we need to make it happen. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let the stories and the voices of the women of Syria that we will hear today, their testimonies of, det of detention, harassment and ill-treatment be a strong incentive for us all to do much more for all those that are still suffering in detention, that are still struggling with the consequences of this detention, and for all the families that are still longing for news about their fa missing families members. Thank you very much. Ambassador Stevens, oops, let me get my microphone. Ambassador Stevens, uh, thank you for your wonderful speech and your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'd like to say I see members, members of civil society in the room, and it's good to see you all here in support and in attendance. Thank you. But I'd also like to say uh, that it's an honor to be here today, and I'm grateful to be sitting next to these wonderful panelists. Without your heroic work, we would not be able to do our job. So thank you for sharing uh, these painful things that you're going to be talking about today. It's your heroic efforts to ensure that those who remain trapped in regime prisons are not forgotten. That's what inspires all of us to go out and do our jobs every day. As you know too well, the death toll in Syria continues to climb. Estimates exceed half a million Syrian lives lost because of the conflict. More than 5.6 million Syrians are refugees, two-thirds of whom are women and children. Another 6.2 million are internally displaced, many of whom have been displaced multiple times since 2011. Cities have been destroyed, families separated, lives shattered. Hundreds of thousands have been detained or disappeared. The people of Syria have suffered enormously. And as we've seen time and time again in conflict zones, Syrian women, increasingly breadwinners, heads of households, caretakers of young and old, and the psychic heart of their families and communities, they have often suffered the most. Now, the civil war in Syria did not begin with violence. It started when ordinary people made peaceful calls for freedom, human rights, and reform. In response, we have witnessed the regime and its backers target civilians with Russian airstrikes and Iranian-supported ground assaults. We have seen them cripple civilian infrastructure, local markets, schools, health care facilities destroyed, detaining men, women, children, medical and humanitarian staff, journalists, and others. Many have been subjected to torture and sexual and gender-based violence, inhumane conditions, denial of fair trials, and even death. Families of the disappeared are often left without any information on the fate of their loved ones. Women and children are increasingly forced to make ends meet as they wait, hoping that their husbands and fathers will return. And the regime continues to commit these heinous acts. The Syrian Network for Human Rights reports at least 1,478 cases of arbitrary arrest since the start of 2019 alone. This madness must end, and that's why we're here. Because we know that there will never be a lasting peace in Syria without tangible progress towards the release of arbitrarily detained Syrian civilians, particularly women, children, and the elderly. Studies show that the real or perceived abuses of women in regime prisons have contributed to the radicalization and recruitment of terrorist fighters for ISIS and other groups. The regime must also adhere to its obligations pertaining to humane treatment of all prisoners, including allowing access by independent monitors. And it must provide families greater access to information on the fate of their detained loved ones. 
Efforts to release detainees have stalled under the auspices of the so-called Astana guarantors, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. We've only seen a few token prisoner exchanges, as you were mentioning, Ambassador, and those were mostly combatants. We all know the vast majority of S Syrian detainees are civilians whose only crime at all was to call for reform and change. That's why we continue to condemn abuses in prisons and call for access to detainees by international mon monitoring bodies in UN resolutions. We will do so again at the third UNGA third committee, excuse me, we'll do so again at the third, gotta get that sentence right, we will do so again during UNGA third committee in the fall with the intent to increase the focus on detainees as we're doing here at this panel. But words are not enough and I think we all know that. This is why the United States and other like-minded countries strongly support the work of the UN Special Envoy, Geir Peterson, who has stated that addressing the plight of detainees is one of his main priorities. We must ensure that the detainee releases and improved access to prisons is included in political discussions aiming to resolve the conflict. It's also the reason that we continue to strongly support the documentation and investigation of abuses in detention centers across the country by the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism on Syria, the IIIM, as well as Syrian organizations like the Syrian Justice and Accountability Center. We also recognize the importance of the work of the UN Independent International Commi Commission on Inquiry, the COI, on Syria, which has reported thousands of cases, credible cases, of government authorities engaging in torture to punish perceived opponents. We look forward to their briefing next week. These organizations lay the foundation for the current and future justice processes, including criminal prosecutions. And we work to mitigate the suffering of those who survived Assad's torture cells and their families. These Syrians deserve support of the international community so that they have the opportunity to thrive, but barriers often impede their access to services, particularly for the women. According to the COI, sexual violence against women and girls at check checkpoints is routine limiting their freedom of movement. Other barriers to services include the fear of being stigmatized and ostracized, as well as distance to service delivery points and family restrictions. In response to increased accesses to services, my team launched the Syrian Survivors of Torture Initiative, SODI, that through these Syrian organizations, SODI could work to address the physical, psychosocial, and legal needs of Syrian survivors of torture, former political prisoners, and their families. But the scale of need is overwhelming. We would welcome greater collaboration through SODI and other efforts to address the needs of survivors. With that, I'd like to conclude so that may we hear from our diverse panelists who represent the millions of Syrians impacted by the regime's horrific actions. I cannot emphasize enough how thankful I am for your courage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassadors. Uh, it's really a great uh, opportunity to hear directly from the women themselves um, who have been brave and um, to document uh, the atrocities that have been witnessed and they are human rights defenders, frontliners and also survivors and we, are, uh, we have this uh, privilege to, to hear the stories from them. Uh, it's a great opportunity because they represent the missing voices of thousands uh, of women and girls who have been silenced because of enforced disappearance, detention, and killings. They represent the voices of many civilian population that have suffered uh, because of the conflict in Syria. Um, I, I am representing the working group on uh, discrimination against women, and uh, our working group recently issued a report on women deprived of liberty, which analyzes the underlying causes of uh, deprivation of women's liberty. In the report, we have identified that one of the causes for um, deprivation of women's liberty is their exposure to violence and conflict. Conflict pushes women into um, disproportionate uh, incarceration and detention and confinement by both state and non-state parties involved in, in, in conflicts. And this resonates with the Syrian experience, and we have also highlighted some of the information we have received concerning Syria and uh, other African and Asian countries who, that are affected by conflict. And this, again, is very important 
um, to the work of uh, our mandate. Uh, we have, um, thanks to uh, these uh, women and many other Syrians who are documenting uh, the stories uh, that the so that the international community, uh, human rights mechanisms, and the whole world is aware of uh, the sufferings of many women and children, men and boys, and all uh, involved. Uh, without, uh, <laughs> we are gathered here to hear from them, so I don't want to take much of the, the, the time. We have uh, these four brave women. Uh, one is Yasmin Benshi, uh, Sema Nasser, Yasmin Mohammed, and Dania Yakub. They will uh, be uh, telling us the stories. Um, the first will be Yasmin Benshi, and second, Yasmin Mohammed, third, Dania Yakub, and uh, the fourth will be Sema Nasser. I would not be uh, in interrupting them, they will go in this order. And just for the information, we have they will be speaking in Arabic, and we have uh, ah yes, mean in English. Uh, we have interpretation, and uh, I'm also told that we we have a Facebook Live, uh, uh, so these uh, others are also following us. Uh, so uh, they are all human rights defenders, as I said, but they will also introduce themselves the way they want to be introduced. So we will start from uh, Yasmin. Ah, that one. We have both Yasmin's, okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Yasmin Benshi from Latakia. I'm a human rights activist, a journalist, and a volunteer CEO at a local humanitarian organization. First, I would like to give you a brief background about my arrest. In 2013, I was arrested by the Syrian regime in a military security branch, 215, which is called the branch of death. Then, in Adra prison, for a year. The psychological torture I endured was unlike any traumatic experience I had lived through. I witnessed the abuse and actual murder of young children, men, and women. That image haunts me to this moment. Later in 2014, I was released with another 24 women detainees in exchange for the Malula nuns at the Syrian-Lebanese border. I still remember when Sister Pelagia hugged me and told me, I'm so happy that you are all free because of this exchange. We assure that exchanges are not the solution because we want a total solution, which is guaranteed by relevant international resolutions. After that, I was forced to flee from the Syria to Turkey for safety. Where I, have been live, where I have been living and working until now. Actually, I want to tell you also about my brother's detention, who was arrested in 2012 by the Syrian regime due to his participation in a peaceful demonstration I was not able to have any information about my little brother. Seven years later, my aunt received a certificate from the Syrian regime confirming the death of my sibling. The death of my sibling. I call upon the international community to
to put pressure on the Syrian regime to hand over the body of my brother and all bodies of the detainees who were killed under the torture. My young brother was like a son to me. I raised him and took care of him after our mother died. That was the most painful that ever happened to me. When my brother died, I knew that he is not the only one, but there are thousands like him. We should not forget and ever given up on calling for their release. So, I'm here today to raise my voice, to raise my voice for him and all of my Syrian sisters and the brothers who are paying a high price for the freedom and democracy that we are all here believe in. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Yasmin Muhammad. English translation is on channel 2, please. English translation, channel 2. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Yasmin Mohammed. I'm a Syrian Kurd from Afrin. At the outset, and as the case of most Syrians, despite uh, the feelings of depression, uh, because we do not see any political solution, and since the international community is unable to do anything in view of the Syrian tragedy, especially with regards to the dossier of detainees, I have been determined to come here and to provide my testimony especially since what is taking place in the detention places of the Assad regime and related militias uh, who are their allies. Does everybody knows the cases of torture, rape, death by f famine, and the privation of health care, all these based on extrajudicial ruling that have nothing to do with justice. I was a university student and I didn't have any direct uh, relationship with politics. But because I was a Syrian, a Kurd from Afrin, my ambition and my dreams were to reduce the security grip and its interference in our private lives and our attempt to obtain our freedoms. On the day I was arrested, which was on the 14th of March 2013, and which lasted about five months, in the military security branch in Aleppo. My greatest concern at the time was the fate of my young daughter, my young sister, who had been arrested with me. The investigator exercised uh, torture, oral or moral torture against me and threatened me to rape her if I did not admit and acknowledge to him the information and confessions he wanted, and that moral torture was more difficult than any kind of bodily torture. However, and after a short time of my presence in the detention place, where I came to know closely the rest of the detainees, detainee women, I discovered that the case is greater than my fear for my younger sister. And because each of these detainee women had become like a sister to me, like a family to me. And I see myself in every woman, in every girl, Syrian girl or woman that was and still is in the detention places. I still remember my colleague Marah in the detention place and Marah and her story. Uh, one of the main reasons that have pushed me to come here today. Marah had been exposed 
to coercion and she had to be subject she had to subject herself to the sick sexual instincts of the investigator ladies and gentlemen maybe marah was raped many times and she had become a sexual slave and then she disappeared or should i be speaking to you about a group of children and minors that i had seen in the detention place and i had heard that they had been raped repeatedly by whom by other military detainees who had refused to fire against civilians in peaceful demonstrations and they found themselves in these detention places and were forced to rape children. They are all victims of dictatorship and oppression in my country. I just have to tell you that my accusation, or I was accused of having transferred medicines and food and uh, children's milk for civilians. And therefore, the, the sanction was that my life was destroyed as well as that of my family. I remember the pictures of Marah and other detainees and how we were all suffering from disease and famine I have met women from Aleppo, from Kobani, Idlib, and other places. Some have disappeared, and no trace of them is left. And some others are still in detention places, as though those who have uh, survived, and me, I being one of them, we still have wounds, deep wounds. I don't think that our uh, lives will continue, and our wounds will be healed. except if we manage to achieve the rule of law and achieve accountability through political transition for a sustainable peace in my country through the implementation of international resolutions under the auspices of Geneva and we have to solve the case of the detainees and not politicize it. Finally, I thank you your kind attention. Good morning. I will be speaking in Arabic. I will try to slow down in for the sake of interpretation. First, I would like to say that my name is Dania Yakub. I have been born in Damascus. I now live in Hamburg, Germany, and I am the director of the Syrian German Association for Women. I was previously a human rights activist defending human rights in Syria, including the rights of women and uh, children. I have been detained three times by the Syrian regime. This detention was arbitrary, without any sentences, any judiciary proceedings. The dates of my detention will stay in my mind rooted in my body and soul, not only because of the physical and psychological suffering I had to go through, but also because I have seen thousands of women that were detained. In the in the prison subjected to systematic rape and torture I have also seen massacres the massacres of my Syrian citizens when I was in solitary confinement in cell number 21 one woman came to my cell she has been arrested at a crossing point between Damascus and Eastern Ghouta this woman has told me that children have suffocated to death because of toxic gas gases being thrown up the chemical attack on Eastern Ghouta. Death was following up everywhere in prison and detention. Thank you all. What is very painful for me is the fact that I have seen children, women, 
children, children detained with their mothers, some of them in solitary confinement uh, underground without any uh, possibility for a normal life, all in the dark. I have uh, taken the hand of a child. I think his age was between six and seven. I remembered my son, so I tried to hug him and hold him in my arms. I thought that by doing so, I would hold in my hands and between my arms the future of Syria destroyed by Assad. I was being tortured and I was been summoned many times to the investigation room. And while going to my investigation rooms, I would see children under legal age that have been arrested and are detained with women in one room. They will be hanging from the wall like we used to be. They would do so so that uh, they get from us fake confessions. Some of the women have been obliged to sign on uh, investigative reports, fake confessions that are pre uh, prepared by investigators. And after hanging the woman from the wall, they will tell her just sign here. I still have many dreams. My dream would be to get one day a PhD, the PhD uh, thesis that I have been working on in Dam Damascus University for four years before being obliged to leave it. During my first and second detention, I stayed in Damascus. I was adamant to stay. But after my third detention, I was afraid for the life of my child, my boy. So I left to Lebanon and then to Germany. Now I am in Hamburg and I got uh, a special protection. I still dream of a democratic country far from dictatorship. And I hope that I will be able one day to go back to Syria in a voluntary and safe return. Yet for that, we have to stop all arbitrary detentions in areas where the swaps are happening. So I hope that uh, all the prisoners and detainees will be fully released and that the fate and destiny of the enforced disappear will be known. I hope that you will make pressure on the regime so that he, they will give you the list of detainees they have. And thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Dania, I would like to thank all the women who had the courage to share with us a part of their testimonies and their life and this very difficult uh, period of their life. My name is Sima Nassar. I work on documenting violence against uh, women, arbitrary arrest and enforced disappearance in Syria since uh, 2011. I am a co-founder of an organization that is uh, working on this file with a number of volunteers and I'm working now on um, a thesis uh, from the London Un University for Economic and Political Studies on the transitional justice in Syria. It's been eight years I'm, I've been working in this field, but yet despite all the suffering that you have heard today, yet this is really uh, just a tip of the iceberg. It's just a tip of the iceberg, a part of the real truth that is happening in uh, government detention centers and prisons, whether secret or not secret. And what is happening within these prisons, they go beyond their wall in order to touch upon the life of the families of detainees. All this makes the file of detainees a very important file, and this is why Solving this uh, issue is a part of the political solution in Syria. We cannot restrict this file to uh, mere prisoner swaps where uh, prisoners of opinion are usually excluded. We cannot consider that prisoner swaps and exchanges are the best uh, solution to go ahead. 
because this is basically what encouraged all the parties uh, to conduct uh, many operations of detention, including uh, uh, detaining women. Since the first prisoner swap, women have been arrested and detained as a weapon uh, and a bargaining chip in Syria. This was also a pretext for people to start blackmailing others. And this has given some paramilitary uh, forces present on the ground a pretext to detain women because no one can say no to uh, saving lives uh, uh, and detainees uh, in prison. This is why they have accepted the prisoner swaps in the first play, place. But we cannot accept prisoner swaps uh, as a part of the solution. If you know that uh, the person that uh, is a part of the prisoner swap is obliged to be deported, to leave the region to another region where he can also be subjected to other violations like it is happening. All the young girls that are a part of the prisoner swaps, they moved to Idlib and then they are subjected to shelling, to deportation, so multiple violations. And uh, prisoner uh, exchanges uh, uh, exacerbate uh, uh, war in Syria, so they do not uh, at, at all support peace. One of the lady, the, one of the ladies here said that the only solution is the immediate release of all detainees. This should be the case, and until we reach that stage, we have to release at least immediately all children, all children that are detained in prisons, and all women that are detained in prisons and centers of detention, and all that have been detained before before July twenty twelve. And we have to freeze as well all the sentences that are being issued by exceptional military courts. Those sentences that have even uh, touched upon children, and you can go back uh, to the report uh, on forgetting, forgotten children that, uh, the, that documents uh, the sentences that have been issued against children in Syria. And the report also talks about uh, the refusal of the authorities uh, to give the bodies, back the bodies uh, of those children or to disclose uh, the mass graves where they have been buried. These are some recommendations that I would like to submit to the international community. I am documenting this file and I would like you uh, to give us more support and to give more support to NGOs that uh, are working on detainees and their forces appearances and adopt a women gender approach in their work. We would like uh, to ask European countries as well uh, to cover the possibility of uh, judging the perpetrators uh, in their countries. But this uh, topic will be covered later on by another colleague. We have asked repeatedly to disclose the fate and destiny of detainees and to give us uh, at least the list uh, of uh, detainees. And what was really surprising and shocking is that uh, in early 2019, the atrocities have even become worse. Those people that have been detained, they have seen this, their civil status change just like that abruptly. Sometimes the families would go to the, the civil status departments and they will discover that their sons or daughters are dead. And if you see a person whose son or daughter is uh, uh, disappeared, has been enforced disappeared, the first uh, uh, advice that we would give to that person would be to go to the civil status department in Syria to check whether they are still uh, alive or not. One uh, father has been asking about his daughter and then the, office, uh, the officer told him, come back in one month. And he came back in one month and he gave him this uh, certificate of death of his daughter. This gives you an idea that these violations are repeatedly committed uh, against Syrians. Uh, I have a lot of say, yet time is tight. Uh, and I think that uh, in the past eight years we have talked a lot, we have written a lot of recommendations, uh, and we have repeatedly asked uh, for having specific sittings uh, and sessions uh, in the Security Council on the issue of uh, detainees and enforced disappeared. Uh, like we are doing today. 
there should be, I think, a hearing, a sitting specifically dedicated to this case, yet to no avail. And here I would like to seize this opportunity to remind you that in May 2013, the Irish Nobel Prize winner, her name is a bit difficult to pronounce, but she visited Syria and she has asked for uh, the release of 72 activists that are completely peaceful. And the Minister of the Justice at that time has promised her to look into the destiny of those people and to release them if they have them. Despite that, those people have not been released, including them, I can cite Mazen Darwish, Yahya Sharbashi, and other of peaceful activists. They have high morals and they are really, they have really integrity and they are committed to non violence and they refuse that weapon will be the solution for the uh, future of Syria. They were only talking about political reforms and about social change. They were really believing in a society that is being ruled by human rights principles. At that time, 19 international organizations have signed a petition in order to ask for the release of these 72 activists and human rights defenders. Only 17 of, uh, 14 of, uh, 17 of them have been released and 14 of them have been released recently from Dar'a prison when the prison was raided. We have so far 39 of them. Their whereabouts are still unknown. We do not even know what is their fate. This is just a sample of all the detained people in Syria. In Ornamo, we uh, have documented the cases of uh, detainees. We have 87,836 people, including 49, uh, 4,989 women, 330 children. And we think that there have been also thousands of women that have delivered their babies during detention in circumstances that have already been covered by my fellow speakers. Before holding a seminar or holding a conference will give us a brief feeling of hope that these people are not forgotten. But today in 2019, we have a, a lot of conferences, a lot of seminars and a lot of events that talk about uh, detainees. And uh, this month, a very important resolution has been taken by the Security Council saying that the priority has to be given to the issue of the missing during uh, conflicts. But all of this has never been reflected posit positively on the fate of those detainees. I will conclude here by raising a question to all of you. After you heard what we had to say, you can ask yourself what you can do to contribute to this cause. What can you do yourself? We don't want this issue to be a bargaining chip used by countries to uh, achieve their self-interest. I think it's high time to changing a bit the course that we have to learn from our mistakes and to go beyond vested political interest. And it's time to ask today, what did we really do to contribute to this cause? Even though talking to our daughters and sons about what's happening in Syria and about this crime that is committed against Syrian every day. So I hope that every one of you will think as a human being before thinking as a decision maker or an influencer, just think as a human being. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin, Sema, Yasmin and Dania. Uh, it was not uh, easy to, I mean, listening, but uh, thank you so much for sharing such uh, personal, emotional, um, and also painful stories. Um, that represent uh, the lived realities of many 
women and girls in Syria. Um, um, uh, thank you. I mean, it, I, I appreciate the brave uh, ways that you told the stories. Um, I'm, 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 uh, I'm sure uh, everybody is touched by, by the stories and uh, also the imagination that many more uh, are, have suffered uh, the same uh, and also more uh, grief human rights violations. Uh, and now we have, uh, uh, it's also emotional for me, I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> not coherent in the way I speak. Um, we have uh, some time for interactive uh, discussion. I'm sure there are also some other women among us who would like to share the stories, their testimonies. Uh, so I will open the floor and 